Welcome to the Graduate Institute in Conversation with podcast series. I'm Lena Menger, Outreach Officer at the Graduate Institute. In this series, we ask renowned experts and thought leaders to address pressing global issues with a Graduate Institute faculty member. On May 5, 2020, the German Constitutional Court declared that the bond buying program of the European Central Bank was ultra virus, meaning exceeding its competences, and therefore explicitly challenged the authority of the European Court of Justice. Joseph Feiler, university professor at NIU School of Law and director of the Jean Monnet Center for International and Regional Economic Law and Justice, and Beatrice Vederdi Mauro, professor of international economics at the Graduate Institute, discuss how this German court ruling affects not only the monetary policy in the Eurozone, but also the future of the rule of law in Europe. Thank you very much, Joseph, for being with us. On May 5th of this year, the German Constitutional Court dropped something like a legal nuclear bomb. These are my words, this is not a quotation, but essentially declaring ECB monetary policy might be illegal in terms of German basic law, and the European Court of Justice might be irrelevant. So its decision of May raised the possibility that the ECB could face serious difficulty in conducting its monetary policy and openly questioned the legality of uh, quantitative easing as well as the wisdom of the higher European court. All of this in the middle of a pandemic, which is why you can appreciate that this was a bit of a bomb. So let me start asking you, Joseph, but could you please explain to our listeners who may not be so familiar with this case, what is its uh, content and significance? So just a word about the procedure. Uh, it takes place within the legal order of the European Union. And as a general principle in the European Union, in the sphere of application of European law, there is a long-standing principle of 60 years that, and this is how it functionally could only be, that in a case of conflict between European Union law and the law of any one member state, the principle of supremacy applies. And as in federal states, the European law must prevail over national law. And to explain just from a pragmatic point of view, if such a conflict exists and a national court decides, no, we're very sorry, but this European Union law is illegal for whatever reason, and therefore we will not apply it, one would have an untenable situation that there will be a one law for some member states and their citizens and another law for other member states and their citizens. And that's why probably the most profound and important from a functional point of view, principle of European constitutional law is the principle of supremacy. Now, there might be cases which call into question whether the European law is legal or not, but the legal order provides for a system where a national court may make what is called a preliminary reference. In other words, it refers the case to the European Court of Justice, and says, look, in our view, this European Union law is illegal. It might violate fundamental human rights. Or as in this case, it might be ultra virus. You know, lawyers like to use Latin because that's why they can charge a lot of money. It means that the European Union has exceeded its competences and should not be even taking this decision. And they send it to the European Court of Justice, on which sit judges from all member states, and it considers the case, and then it issues a preliminary ruling and sends it back to the national court and says, we've considered what you have to say. You are right. The European Union law is invalid, is illegal, because, for example, it violates fundamental human rights. Or it can send it back and say, even after taking what you said into consideration, we think the European Union law has to uh, is valid and has to prevail. And this happens countless times, thousands of times in the history of the European Union. What happened in Vice was 
that the German Constitutional Court, there was a petition by German nationals to the German Constitutional Court, and they considered that uh, the decision and the policy of the European Central Bank in relation to quantitative easing exceeded the competences of the European Union. In legalese, it was ultra virus. And therefore, if it's ultra virus, it cannot apply. And in that case, Germany could not participate in those kind of activities, including various aspects of quantitative easing. The European Court of Justice considered the preliminary reference from the German Constitutional Court and sent its decision saying we have considered it and we find that the European Central Bank did not exceed its competences. The European Union did not exceed its competences and therefore those policies are legal. And that's where the German Constitutional Court threw its bomb, what you called its nuclear bomb, because it said we find the decision of the European Court of Justice unacceptable. In fact, they said we don't even understand it and therefore it will not be followed. Now, there are two implications for this. First of all, as we've heard, that it calls into question one of the central policies of the European Central Bank in managing uh, the monetary affairs of the European Union, now pressing more than ever in the various plans for the response to the economic crisis uh, created by coronavirus. But secondly, and in my view, even of a deeper uh, uh, significance, it's the fact that a court of the statute of the German Constitutional Court just decided to take the law into its own hand and to disregard a decision of the European Court of Justice, compromising the principle of supremacy, calling into question uh, the principle of the equal application of European Union law in all the member states, and in what could be called as collateral damage, uh, injecting a virus into the legal system of the European Union order, because it's an invitation to other courts in other member states to say, well, if the Germans can do this, why should we not do the same when we face similar issues, not necessarily of the European Central Bank, but every member state now and again has some grievance with a European Union law, which is not to its liking. I'll stop here because I just try to set the scene for our listeners. Right. Thank you very much for that. You have already said uh, the key thing that the German Constitutional Court here is actually doing something which is really novel and potentially extremely dangerous. But there is some history also, isn't there? I mean, the, the, the Constitutional Court in Karlsruhe has been called to rule on the legality of uh, European Central Bank monetary policy programs more than once. And more generally, the question about ultra-virus and who is ultra-virus? Is it the German Constitutional Court or is it the European Court of Justice or the ECB uh, can be legitimately asked? So, so can you give us a bit more about the, the history of why did the uh, German Constitutional Court do what they did in your view? So there is a history and it's a very long history and it even precedes the creation of the Euro European Central Bank in which the German Constitutional Court, which until this decision was really considered, if you want, the primus inter pares among constitutional courts of the member states, the most respected, and with good reason, uh, it issued kind of warnings. It said, if, for example, many years ago, the European Union does not introduce its own protection of fundamental human rights, we cannot guarantee that we will always respect the European Union laws should we find that they violate fundamental human rights. And there have been some decisions of this nature also in relation to the ECB. But what characterizes uh, what is different from the present case are two things. In the first instance, those previous cases were just uh, warnings. The dog that barks but does not bite. 
they said if, 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 and if, then we will have to consider, etc. But they never went and actually did what they did in the vice decision. And the second thing is that they always faced in abstract the possibility, the potential that the European Union law would violate some constitutional principle which the German court considered inviolable. What is different in this case is, first of all, that they defied directly, and this is novel, a decision of the European Court of Justice. It's not just the principle of European Union law. It's not just a law that they call into question. They actually asked the European Court of Justice to rule on the case. The European Court of Justice ruled on the case, and that should be the last word on the matter. And then they decide, they decided to defy it and to say, we just don't care. We don't understand. It's a, Maybe even the European Court of Justice acted beyond its competences, acted ultra virus. And secondly, and it's implicit in what I said, they were not just issuing a warning, please be careful in the future. They actually went ahead and did it. Now, I should say that one of the big victims of this vice decision is the German Constitutional Court itself. Because in the, in my view and the view of many others, it shows the worst case in order to demonstrate uh, its power. And its reasoning was very unconvincing. And at least in two respects. In the first case, in previous decisions in relation to the ECB and ultra virus exceeding competence, they said it would have to be an egregious violation of the, an extreme case of violating the competences of the European Union. And in this case, they did not say that quantitative easing and associated policies were, was such a case. What they hang, what they focused on, they said, when the European Central Bank takes a decision of this nature, its decision must be proportionate. It must take into consideration all external factors, not only for monetary policy, but for the economy of the union and the economies of the member states. And by not doing that, they would be exceeding their competences. But even more, kindly bear with me, they did not even say that the European Central Bank did not take this into consideration. They said, we do not have proof. They did not demonstrate that they took it into consideration. This is an extremely trivial point on which to drop the atom bomb because all they're saying, it's not clear that they would have, that they have done it. And that's also suggests, suggests to me that the consequences of this decision in relation to the European Central Bank monetary policy, quantitative easing, might not be as grave as one feared on first reading the case, because all it would take is for, for example, the German government, and they've already in recent days began to take that move, to open the records and to say, actually, you were wrong. The European Central Bank did take into consideration. They deliberated about it. They considered all factors. And having considered all factors, they decided the case they de decided to pass this policy as they did. So it seems to be uh, starting a war, not because somebody dropped an atom bomb, but because somebody fired one shot over the border. You don't drop the atom bomb in relation to potentially a trivial complaint that the German constitutional uh, court made. So the German constitutional court itself would be the first victim of this decision because it's been knocked off the pe pedestal of being the most serious, the most deliberative, the most responsible constitutional court in the European Union. No one will look at it anymore in this way. So that's why I am not too concerned. I know this is contestable, but I am not too concerned about the effects of this decision immediately on the functioning of the European Central Bank and the ability of the Germany and the European Union to confront if they should decide with the instruments of the European Central Bank, the post-COVID-19 economic crisis. 
but the constitutional damage to the legal order of the European Union is incalculable because what seemed to be an unbreakable principle that once the European Court has directly spoken, its decision has to be honored, not least by the court who asked it to rule, has been breached. And that kind of damage if we have time, I will suggest how we might remedy it, but that kind of damage is much more much more difficult uh, to overcome. Interesting, yes. Uh, you, you see here maybe the, the difference between the lawyer and the economist, uh, i.e. myself, who our concern, of course, is much, much more for the possible consequences for monetary policy especially against the background of a very, very hostile uh, public opinion against the ECB and an increasingly hostile public opinion uh, against the ECB in Germany and also, also a few other northern countries. But in particular, in Germany, there has been a widespread and increasing opinion that uh, not only QE, but also, you know, the law and uh, almost negative interest rates were actually harming the savers. And, and this proportionality then speaks a lot to these people who are of the, of the view that the ECB monetary policy was not taking their concerns into, into consideration. But as you said, at the end of the day, by focusing on proportionality in the, in the way the court also made it relatively easy uh, and let's let's face it they put they put the bundesbank um, more and the german institutions into a diff more difficult position than the ecb in the first place because it's the it's the bundesbank that would have been bound not to participate anymore in monetary policy decisions of the european central bank but uh, it's it's correct that essentially the monetary bomb uh, is uh, on the way to being diffused or has already been diffused uh, since the German Bundestag uh, uh, committees have been allowed to look into the protocols and, <laughs> surprise, they did actually find out that the ECB did look at the trade-offs involved in its monetary policy decisions. So, so You're right. It, it would have been much more damaging had the German Constitutional Court said that simply because of these consequences, the ECB cannot act in this manner. But all they said is, we need to see that it took it into consideration. And I must say that from a common sense point of view, not from a legal point of view, just from a common sense point of view, uh, the ECB board, there's a representative of uh, the German uh, central bank. Is it really plausible, thinkable, that when they took these decisions, they did not consider the implications, for example, to very low or even negative interest rates on the savings of citizens of the European Union, including Germany? It's just not thinkable. It's laughable to imagine that they did not take it into consideration. Now, you might not agree with how they, at the end of the day, balance the various interests, but to to suggest that they didn't do that, and because of that, to defy a decision of the European Court of Justice, I find laughable and trivial. And indeed, the record immediately shows, even the record publicly available, one doesn't have to go into confidential protocols to see that they did to take it into consideration. It's obvious that if you have interest rates at around 0%, people who put their saving in a bank and get 0.1% on their savings are going to suffer. So we can question whether it's a good or bad policy, but that's why we have a European Central Bank. And they, at the end of the day, said that in the long-term interest of the economic uh, health of the European Union, one has to suffer these consequences until one super, uh, uh, overcomes the crisis. But to suggest that they didn't take it into consideration, I don't think a reasonable person could even imagine, and the facts show that they did take it into consideration. And that would be my next uh, question or also suggestion in that sense, but something good on this aspect may actually have come out of the diffusion of this, you know, potential deadly threat uh, to, to the European institution, namely the ECB. Namely, the fact that as a consequence, the agreement is now that the Bundesbank, that is, you know, Jens Weidmann himself, will more regularly 
uh, explain monetary policy to the German uh, parliament. And that that may actually have a positive impact in the sense that the Bundesbank will have to be more engaged in engaging with the possible opposition and the counter arguments within Germany than it has been doing so far. And a second question that has been posed, I would like to ask you on this also, is whether this Karlsruhe verdict may have accelerated to a certain extent uh, in Germany, but also in Europe, to move to a more strong uh, move in, in, in the area of fiscal uh, policy by showing the limits to monetary policy. Because there is, you know, just a few weeks later, we do find ourselves with a very, very different um, picture uh, in terms of what the European Commission is putting on the table to deal with the pandemic crisis from a, from a fiscal point of view. Would, would you share this, this uh, view that uh, indirectly this, this attack on European institutions may end up strengthening them? Well, here I'm not speaking as an expert, but just as a kind of your average informed reader of the Financial Times every day. But many people have said that the change of heart by Mrs. Merkel, uh, who was opposed to the initial thoughts about the emergency fund and or the various facilities that are now being discussed, uh, changed her mind and got in touch with uh, Macron and said, no, we really have to act came very swiftly after the decision of the German Constitutional Court. And in a way, some people speculated speculate that it was driven by that because Mrs. Merkel understood the historic responsibility of Germany as the most important economy and wanted to signal, don't think that because of this decision, our commitment to Europe, etc., is less strong. So she took a dramatic shift of position and therefore i agree with you that it might have had the unintended consequence of moving ahead the notion uh these small steps towards uh, uh a fiscal union and closing the historical back gap between a union with extensive monetary competences and very very weak f fiscal competences so yes it might have had that unintended consequences but it might have also negative consequences in other fields. Uh, I, I compared it to a virus. So let me give you another very serious conflict which the European Union has, is facing. Take the case of Poland. Poland has engaged in a reform of its judiciary, which is very controversial. And the European Court of Justice has said that various aspects of that reform uh, compromise the rule of law of the European legal order because a Polish citizen that goes before Polish courts who have to apply European Union law will now be facing courts which, in the view of the European Court of Justice, does not live up to the standard of the rule of law that every European citizen is entitled to. The reaction of the Polish government was to say the European Union is acting ultra vires when it tries to decide how we should run our judicial system. And now one could imagine that they would be emboldened and their courts would be emboldened simply to say, well, we also think that in the matter of the rule of law and the function of our courts, the European Court of Justice has acted ultra vires, and if the German Constitutional Court could say that, why should we not say that? And I could give you similar examples from other member states. So even though it might have produced a positive effect in relation to uh, fiscal Europe, it risks uh, a spillover effect in other areas which would compromise the integrity of the European Union on matters no less serious, for example, the rule of law of the European Union is as important as its economic health. And you already mentioned that you have a solution, uh, something that can heal this problem? So there's not a foolproof solution. If you have a rogue court, if you have a rebel court of a member state, uh, the European Union does not have an army that can send in and arrest the judges. 
uh, and we are proud of that in Europe. Uh, but now I want to say that although the German court in this case acted irresponsibly and damaged the union and damaged its own reputation, there is a real problem underlying this case. And let me explain very quickly what the real problem is. When it comes to the limits of competences of the European Union, it is the case, and it's structurally the case, that that is a matter that directly implicates European constitutional law, but also national constitutional law. And we can put ourselves in the shoes of a national constitutional court and say, well, what are we to do if our constitution tells us that when we transferred powers to the European Union, these were limited powers as a matter, for example, of German constitutional law. And now the European Union is acting in a way and exercising powers that we constitutionally never transferred to them. It's a real problem. And this is a kind of circle which is very difficult to square because on the one hand, as I said before, you cannot take the court of every member state to decide for himself and fragment the legal order of the European Union and the equal application of European Union law throughout the member states. On the other hand, the National Constitutional Court does face a question. What if in our best view, in good faith, this violates national constitutional law? And this is the basis for the solution that together with a Spanish lawyer, uh, Professor Daniel Sarmiento, we put forward a couple of weeks ago a position paper with the following solution. So let me outline it in three minutes. Number one, we say we cannot compromise the principle that when it comes to the legality of European Union law, the last word has to be that of the European Court of Justice, number one. Number two, our listeners should know that the European Court of Justice has 27 judges, but they never sit all 27 judges. That would be unwieldy. So they sit in chambers. Uh, there are smaller chambers and there is the grand chambers of a number of judges. So our proposal is to add one chamber to the European Court of Justice. In other words, the European Court of Justice would add a new chamber to the court. And what would be special about that chamber, that it would be composed, for example, of uh, 12 judges, six of which would be judges that are now sitting on the European Court of Justice, and six of the other judges would be appointed in an ad hoc manner if a case like this should come up from the national constitutional courts of the member states. So that now we would have a, a court that had six national constitution, uh, not a court, a chamber of the European Court of Justice, which would have six national constitutional court judges and six European court judges. And they would decide the case, and we suggested that if there's a contested uh, uh, law of the European Union on the grounds of lack of comp uh, com uh, competence, ultra virus, to validate that law, it would have to have a majority of at least seven and maybe even eight judges. In other words, that at least one or two national constitutional court judges would say the European Union is acting legally, is acting intra virus. What is the advantage of this proposal? It, I think, gives a much greater legitimacy to a decision of the European Court of Justice deciding we've heard the concerns of a national constitutional court we understand that questions of intra virus and ultra virus concerns not only European Union law, but also national constitutional law. But here we have a court on which the judges sitting are also judges from the national constitutional courts, and they have decided that the European Union has acted, has not acted illegally. We believe that such a chamber of the European Court of Justice would speak with a much greater authority than the European, the normal chambers of the European Court of Justice, 
and it will be much, much more difficult for a national constitutional court to defy a decision of that chamber, knowing that at least eight judges, including judges of the national constitutional court, have decided that the European Union has not acted ultra virus. It wouldn't stop at the end of the day, a rogue national court from saying, we don't care, we're still not going to accept the decision. But we think that both legally and politically and socially, it will be much more difficult to do. And that such a decision will not be accepted and be welcomed, both in the country in which it takes place and throughout the European Union. So it's not a foolproof solution. But we think it would go go a long way to allay concerns that when the European Court of Justice consider these issues, they really should acknowledge and understand that it's also a question of national constitutional court. Now, we have published our uh, position paper, and it's easily found on the Internet, so I don't want to go into all the details, but that is the principle uh, underlying our proposed solution for the future to this problem. Excellent uh, that you also have a solution. That's wonderful. Just uh, let our readers uh, know what is the title of this paper so they can more easily find it. And maybe as a last word, what has been the reception? Have you been getting lots of uh, interest and uh, positive feedback? The name of the paper is The EU Judiciary After Vice, Proposing a New Mixed Chamber. I think if they Google mixed chamber European Court of Justice, it will jump up. We have had lots and lots of reactions, some supportive, some critical, asking many questions. Would it work? Would it work in this way? What about this? What about that? So next week, either on Sunday or on Monday, we will be publishing a follow up paper, which will be. Uh, an answer to our critics trying to address some of the concerns, the questions, the criticism, and also the suggestions that were made in relation to to this proposed uh, solution. We think it's a constructive solution. We don't think that it's 100%, but we think that everybody is looking for a solution and a structural solution, not an ad hoc solution. Let the Bundesbank say, do or not do this. Let the German Bundestag do this. Let the German government do that. But how to resolve in principle this kind of issue from arising in the future? And to the best of my knowledge, but I might be mistaken, uh, right now it's the only comprehensive solution that has been put on the table. It probably will not be accepted exactly in the way which we have proposed it, but at least it's food for thought. And to judge from the reaction, not just by casual readers, but by governments, by the commissions which we were receiving privately, we think that it is being considered seriously. Wonderful. How lucky we are to be able to end on this uh, super positive note. It was a, a fascinating 30 minutes with you. Thank you so much, Joseph, for taking the time. Thank you to our listeners. And I say goodbye. Good night from Singapore. Thank you very much. And everybody keep safe. That was Joseph Feiler discussing the impact of the German Constitutional Court's recent ruling on the stability of the European Union with Beatrice Feder di Mauro. For more information about the Graduate Institute, please visit graduateinstitute.ch. I'm Lena Menge. Thanks for listening.